again, our heritage. And so instead of, as we talk about the mark of the beast as pointing to someone else, I believe that the Bible and the book of Revelation is wanting us to look very carefully at our own selves. Yes, yes, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The traditional posture that we have taken as Seventh-day Adventists is correct. The presentation in our free offer, the mark of the beast, is right on target. But unfortunately, sometimes things in the Bible that have painted historical personages and future personages in a less than desirable light have led Christians to point fingers. I think the message today is more necessary than ever before because we're in a world that is very sensitive about using religion to oppress other people. So as we speak today about this important topic, we are not pointing fingers at any individual or any person who has a certain heritage. This is our heritage as Christians that we're looking at. Well, with that background, God has been interested in something for his people to share, not just a heritage that's marred, but to be infused with his heritage, his line, and his principles. In Sunday's lesson, we see that God is anxious not only to invite everyone to be his, but to seal them, but to give them signs that demonstrate their loyalty. So the first sign that we're going to look at is actually one that was highlighted in the Old Testament times, and it comes to us in a rich rich heritage. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 16 as we pick up the storyline. I'm turning to Genesis 16. This is, of course, the story of Abraham, the father of the faithful. So again, we're speaking about our heritage. Now, in Genesis 16, we read that there was a problem that Abraham had. Now, You say, to just jump in here might be unfair, and I know these stories are often so familiar, but if we were to take the story of Abraham from the beginning, we'd start in Genesis 12. And in Genesis 12, the Lord has this promise that he gives Abraham. So let's start there, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Genesis chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. God speaks. He says, get out of your country, speaking to Abraham, Leave your family, leave your father's house, go to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now here's the question. God was promising to make of Abraham a great nation. Of course, he's referred to as Abram here. But how many are in Abram's line at this point in the story? How many children does Abram have? He has none. And as the story plays out, Abram begins to get more and more worried about his lack of lineage. When we come to chapter 15, Abraham is clearly struggling. And so in chapter 15, God again comes to Abram in a vision. And he says, don't be afraid, Abram. When do you say to someone, don't be afraid? When they're afraid, that's right. Don't be afraid, Abram's afraid. He's afraid of what? Listen to what God says, I am your shield. I'm your exceeding great reward. But Abram says, he reveals what his fear is. He says, Lord God, will you, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So he's looking to one of his servants, his chief servant. He's saying, this is who's going to have to inherit my line. Lord, but you promised you'd make of me a great nation. What does God say? Verse 4, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And so God keeps repeating this promise of an abundant heritage to Abraham. Well, by the time we come to chapter 16, Abraham's really getting worried. Now, by the way, I should mention, one of the key texts in the Bible is Genesis 15, verse 6. It is one of the key texts in the Bible, repeated again in the New Testament. Because in verse 6 of Genesis 15, it says, Abram did what? 
He believed God. He believed in the Lord. He trusted God, and God counted it to him for righteousness. So we speak about righteousness by faith, trusting in God that he'll fulfill his promises. And really, we're getting at the essence of this issue of God's seal versus the mark of the beast. We're seeing it here in Abraham's story, even though we may not be seeing it clearly just yet. When we come to chapter 16 now of Genesis, what does Abraham do? You know the story. Abraham still has no children. His wife, Sarah, sees there's no children. She actually suggests to Abram in verse 2 of chapter 16, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. Now, is this crazy? I mean, it sounds crazy, doesn't it, to us today? But the thing is, Sarah believes the promise. She believes that Abraham will have children of his own, from his own seed, and she says, well, I can't do it. She's not really trusting the Lord either, is she? And so they take matters into their own hands. And Abraham does have a child, Ishmael. Now we're in chapter 17. That was all background for where we're headed. Abraham now, 99 years old. And again, God appears to him. He says, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply your seed exceedingly. And as the story plays out, God speaks of an everlasting covenant. And that covenant will be given not through Ishmael, but through a seed that will be born miraculously, a child born to Abraham and to Sarah. And in this context, in this context, God says in verse 10 of Genesis 17, this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. We're going to have one of our members share a verse in just a moment from Romans chapter 4. But before we do, I want you to pick up the significance of what's happening here. What has Abraham just done in chapter 16? What has he shown his trust was in? His trust was in his flesh, right? In himself. Abraham trusted in his flesh. Sarah trusted in Abraham's flesh. And now what is God asking them to do? The sign of the covenant becomes a cutting off of the flesh. Now, you might say, well, this is being a little bit too graphic, but we need to turn in our Bibles to Romans, Romans chapter 4. We have someone who will be reading that for us momentarily, Romans 4, 11 and 12. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised that he might be the father of all those who believe though they are uncircumcised that righteousness might be imputed to them also and the father of circumcision to those who not only are the circumcision but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Thank you. Do you catch the picture here? Abraham was righteous by faith in Genesis 15, right? And when we get to Genesis 17, now God is asking him a sign. God is sealing him. It's a seal. It's a sign of what? of righteousness by faith. Do you catch this? 
It's a sign that he's trusting God. He's cutting off his flesh. He's saying, I'm not trusting in what I can do. I'm trusting in God's promise. And so God gives this beautiful sign. It really is. It's a seal, as the Apostle Paul put it, of what? A seal of the righteousness by faith. And I'd like to suggest to you the essence of God's seal always includes this element of trusting in him and righteousness by faith. Not somehow trying to find our righteousness by what we do, but righteousness by what? By trusting a God who calls us righteous in the midst of our sinfulness. Right? So we can come to God just as we are. He's not content to leave us in sin, right? But he sealed Abraham before Abraham was perfect, before the child had even been born. It was a sign of Abraham's trust in the father. So we see this seal. But what's crazy about this outward seal is what happened to it. What was the history of the Jewish nation? By the time we come to the book of Galatians, turn there. The Jews had so perverted this sign, this seal of cutting off of the flesh, of not depending on the flesh and trusting in God, that they began to trust in the sign that it was a sign that they didn't trust in their flesh. Does that make any sense at all? You say, you just said that way too quickly. How could it make sense to anybody? D do you catch it? God was saying, you're cutting off the flesh. You're not trusting in the flesh. It's a sign of righteousness by faith. And the Jews are going around saying, we are good because we are the circumcised. We're God's people. We are trusting in our flesh in so many words. Look with me at Galatians. It had gotten so bad. The church had become so polarized, the early church. And some were thinking they had to be circumcised to be saved. Paul put it this way in Galatians chapter 5. Verse 2, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Now, wait a minute. How could that happen? How could circumcision go from a sign or a seal of righteousness by faith to a sign that someone was not trusting in God? Yes, because of tradition. And because of a misinterpretation of the good thing that God had given. Now, this is really crazy when you think about it. God gives a seal or a sign of righteousness by faith, and his people can pervert it into a sign that becomes identified with showing our own righteousness by our works. Now, this is a sobering thought as we continue this study, because this theme does not stop as we continue to look at this topic of sealing. Sunday's lesson doesn't stop with that seal because in the New Testament there is another seal, another sign that takes the place of circumcision, if you will. Circumcision is set aside as a sign of the covenant, as a sign of righteousness by faith, and in its place is the sign of baptism. Turn in your Bible to another of Paul's letters. This time we're going to Romans. And again, we want to catch this. The significance of baptism in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. There are a number of passages that are mentioned in the lesson study, but let's highlight this one in particular. Romans 6. We could begin, well, begin with verse 1. We probably should, just in case you've misunderstood anything I've said to this point. Romans 6, 1 begins with a question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So by speaking about grace and righteousness by faith, we're not setting aside God's law. In fact, Paul makes it quite emphatic here. He says we sh he's not condoning sin. His answer to that rhetorical question, shall we continue in sin that grace may be abound? Verse 2, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And then he speaks about this sign or this seal now of baptism. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So you get the picture here. So now our sign of dying to self, of identifying with Christ's death, is baptism. So we go into the watery grave in baptism. We're fully immersed. We're, we die and then we're resurrected up, right? That beautiful symbolism. And by the way, if you haven't been baptized with Bible baptism, this is a, a reminder that this is something that God has put his approval on. And uh, be sure to talk with one of the elders or one of the pastors here because this is something that God asks of his people. You say, well, wait a minute, if he asked something of us, if he asked circumcision of them in the Old Testament, then surely it's some work that must save us. No, Jesus is complete. Paul wrote, you are complete in him. It's not in our lineage that we trust. It's not in the signs that we embrace, although God uses those. It's in trusting a loving father. Have you thought about it that way? So think about it. Are there people that will be in the kingdom that have never had water baptism? You know, Jesus went through every step the sinner needed to do. And not only was Jesus setting an example there at the Jordan when John baptized him, I believe that Jesus was providing a sufficient record that can be assumed by anyone who's in a situation where they can't be baptized maybe in an unusual prison setting, or maybe on a cross like that thief who died beside Jesus. No opportunity to be baptized, was there? But Jesus did what? He gave them, him the assurance of salvation. Why? Because he trusted in him. So God has used signs of the covenant throughout history, but there are other signs that mark people and to whose they are. We're going to have a scripture reading from the book of Revelation in just a moment, from Rev Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. But before we go there, just a reminder, we've been looking at a drama as the book of Revelation has been playing out. And by the way, lest we miss something, lest we miss something, some of you think I've been taking liberty with um, saying the heritage of some of these powers in Romans 13 is a heritage we all need to, to own. But uh, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Those of you who've studied the book of Revelation realize that among the parallel prophecies, time prophecies in the Bible, are the prophecies of the seven churches, which, by the way, are actually literal messages to seven literal churches in John's day, but they're also prophetic descriptions of ages of church history. And if you study out the seals, it parallels this very precisely. And as you read through Revelation 2 and 3, in these letters to the seven churches, when we come to the seventh church, Bible scholars for decades have realized this refers to the last Christian church era when we come to that last or the seventh church, which is known as the church of Laodicea. So go with me there to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. It says, These things says the Amen the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. These are all descriptors of Jesus who was revealed to John in chapter 1. And here's the words of Jesus, verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Oh, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy of me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness be, they may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And then what is the message? What is the summary of that message? to the end time church. Be zealous and repent. So basically, as we read through the book of Revelation, it's not we're putting down a group of people or a church. 
or a church system that we're putting these people down, anyone connected with it, and we're supposed to walk proudly because we have the seal of God, as we'll look at a little bit later, another of God's seals. But it's realizing that we all need to examine ourselves. The book is the revelation of what? Of Jesus. It's not a revelation of how good his people are. It's a revelation of how good Jesus is. And the ones who stand complete, we'll see, are the ones who stand complete because they are hidden in Jesus. Hidden in Jesus. Revelation 13 brings into focus, just one of the places, it brings into focus the mark that Satan, if you will, has in Satan's kingdom. We have someone who's going to read for us Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So again, this is a bit of review, but it's critical for today's topic. We looked last week at the identity of the beast. And we saw that it, that first beast power in Revelation 13 applies with particular force to the medieval Roman church, sometimes referred to as the institution of the papacy. And it's rightly been pointed out, and we've tried to allude to this already, that this is not speaking about individuals in that church. It's not speaking about any individual pope. It's speaking about a system that, as Pastor Jean so clearly portrayed last week, is a system that historically has set itself in opposition to God's principles. It is really a, a system, if you will, that has trusted in its own judgment, in its own flesh, right? Right? There is, in contrast to that seal, that sign of allegiance to the beast, that is a sign of allegiance to God. And in the end times, what is highlighted in the book of Revelation is not circumcision. That's been set aside. Baptism, although it's still reinforced in the New Testament, that is not the identifiable seal that is especially highlighted in the book of of Revelation. We want to look at a very interesting verse, and someone has this scripture for us as well, because we're going to find that there's an internal seal as well as an external seal. And both of these go hand in hand. That internal seal, again, is described very clearly in the writings of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church of Ephesus. And someone's going to read for us in just a moment from Ephesus. The letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In, in him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So the book of Ephesians is writing again to a polarized church. Okay, so if you're going to go back in history, by the way, Ephesus is the first church mentioned in the book of Revelation. It is one of those seven churches identified, so it would be in what we would call Turkey today. And as Paul was writing to this Christian church, there was a lot of tension between Jews and Gentiles. So in the book of Ephesians, Paul is speaking of how Christ makes us all one. We're all one in him. And uh, some of the most beautiful expressions of salvation are found in Ephesians chapter 2 about God who is rich in mercy, not looking to us for what we've done. Look, look at there, Ephesians 2 verse, verse 4. Let's just read some of these verses. Ephesians 2 beginning with verse 4. God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. So what is our situation? Our lineage and our own behavior condemns us. Okay, we have nothing to boast in. But God is what? Rich in mercy. Now, many people aspire to have wealth in our culture, right? But how many people really aspire to be rich in the things that are of most value? How many of you aspire to be rich in mercy? 
rich in mercy. This is the characteristic of our Father. He's rich in mercy, and it says, His great love wherewith He loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses. So how do you feel today? Are you seeing yourself dead in trespasses? Do you see your sin before you? The Bible often paints that picture to us. And it's not to drive us into the dirt. It's to help us realize that we have a loving Father who forgives all of us who have trespassed greatly. Isn't that good news? And so Paul here in this letter is establishing our faith. He's establishing it on Jesus. He made us alive. I'm continuing verse 5 of Ephesians 2. We were made alive together with Christ. He's raised us up together. He's made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But Paul doesn't stop there. Many Christians would like to stop right there, but he continues in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So coming back to Ephesians 1 that we just heard read. In Ephesians 1, God speaks of a redeemed people that are sealed internally, and they are sealed how? With the Holy Spirit of promise. How can we live the kind of lives that God wants us to live? It said, we just read it. We're called in Jesus to good works. We're not saved by our works, but we're called to live in harmony with God's loving principles. What's the longest chapter in the Bible? Psalm 119, that's right. What is Psalm 119 all about? It's the psalmist rejoicing in how much he loves the law. Now, it's true, the law points to our need for a Savior. The law drives us to Jesus. But once we're there, the law has not ceased. It's another important purpose, and that is revealing God's character. We see in the law God's loving character. We see what it looks like to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so it should come as no surprise, as we're looking at this topic from this perspective, that the seal of God, as identified in the book of Revelation, is a surprising one to some Christians. So go, go back with me to Revelation 13. We just read not long ago from Revelation 13 about the mark or the seal of a power that sets itself in opposition to God and his people. But now we come to Revelation 14. And someone in just a moment is going to read how just right after this mark of the beast is described, we have the mark or the seal of God referred to. So Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. So there is something in verse 16 of Revelation 13 that's on the foreheads of those who are identified with the beast powers. And there is something on the forehead of those who are identified with God. What is this on the forehead of those who have trusted in Jesus? What's on their foreheads? Well, it's a ceiling. It's the name. Do you see it there? Revelation 14.1. The Father's name is on their foreheads. Now turn your Bibles to Exodus 34. Just to remind you of something, God's name is synonymous with his character. When we speak about the name of God, we're speaking about God's character. The righteous are sealed with God's character. Exodus 34. You know that Moses was longing for a revelation, a fuller revelation of God. He asked God to see him. In Exodus 34, verse 5, Exodus 34, verse 5, We read this, now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, with Moses there, and proclaimed what? The name of the Lord. 
So God is now going to proclaim, is he going to just say, Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah? Is that what we're going to hear? He's going to proclaim the name of the Lord. What are we going to hear? Look what it says, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, yes, there is that holy name of God, Jehovah or Yahweh. The Lord God continues, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Now, we like the first part of it. We say it's a beautiful character, loving, merciful, kind. But by the way, do we appreciate, do we appreciate the character of someone who overlooks atrocities? Someone who overlooks things that, that harm us? God is going to purify the planet. And those that cling to sin will lovingly be put out of their misery before the conclusion of all time. What is the seal of God? It's God's character, and it's especially represented, it's especially embodied in God's law. In Wednesday and Thursday's lesson, Thursday in particular, it speaks of the Sabbath as a seal. By the way, I don't know if you picked up on it, but when we read that, me that message to the last church in Revelation chapter 3, how was one of the ways that Jesus was identified? Did you pick up on it? It says he's the beginning of the creation of God. He is the source of creation. So the Laodicean church, the end time church, has a revelation of Jesus as creator. Look now with me at Exodus chapter 20. Because we just want to remind ourselves of something that is uh, basically pointed to as we look at God's end time seal. Exodus chapter 20, they're familiar words, but as we read in the heart of the commandment, God's special sign, the Sabbath, it says there in verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Now think about this for a minute. Think about this for a minute. As we come to the book of Revelation, as we've been looking at God's end time people, a people that trust him fully, that have absolute confidence in the Father, one of the things they're doing is they're representing God's character. And as we read about the seal of God in multiple places, by the way, you could look back as far as Revelation 7. You'd see a seal there. A sealing work is taking place in Revelation chapter 7. As you read on, you read about a sealing work taking place in Revelation 14. We just looked at it. In contrast to those who receive the mark of the beast, as that third angel's message is given, we read in Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who do what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We're called to worship the creator in the last days and the sign of the creator's authority is the Sabbath. God is wanting to place his seal on our foreheads. That is basically in our minds. You read about a mark of the beast on the hand and on the forehead. By the way, and we'll mention this again just before we finish, this study, the mark of the beast that we have as the free offer goes into great detail in all these things. If you're wondering how to connect all the dots, but this point is simply this. Whether we accept this seal of uniting with the beast power, the powers that are in opposition, if you will, to God, and the hand in the Bible is a symbol of our works, the mind, our thoughts, whether we're deceived and go along with the end time powers in opposition to God or whether we act in harmony with those powers for fear of 
economic boycott or life itself, we bear the mark of the authority of the earthly powers that trust in themselves to, quote, do God's will. In contrast, we have a choice. Will we bear God's seal? Will we allow his Holy Spirit to put his character in our lives and to embrace his law, which is his character represented? And especially in the heart of the law is the seventh day Sabbath. It is our sign that we are his. Now, lest again, coming back to that opening imagery, lest we somehow think this is a reason to be proud that we are keeping the Sabbath, that we're here on church on the seventh day, on Saturday, lest we are proud of ourselves, if we trust in our Sabbath keeping, we're just as lost as the Jews who trusted in their circumcision. Our trust is where? Our trust is in Jesus. And we keep the Sabbath as a sign of our loyalty to the loving Savior who saved us. Do you see how that comes through? God's last day message calls for his people to come out of Babylon. We're entrusted to give that message to a world, many of whom don't understand. Many wonderful Christians don't realize this special end time sign. Do you want to learn more about it? Our closing offer goes into much more detail than we've been able to touch on here. And if you're disappointed with what I didn't cover, get the special offer, The Mark of the Beast. It is offer 127. You can get it by calling our toll-free number. That's 866-788-2966. Simply 866-STUDY-MORE. Or you can text. You can text to the number 40544 and you uh, request SH056. SH056, that w is what is showing up on our uh, flyer, on our free gift, and uh, you can get that simply for asking. Well, thank you for joining us today. By God's grace, we'll be back again together next week studying more about the end time. I invite you to join us then.